In this video, we're going to take a deep dive into our first major content area, biological psychology. But I want to start by answering a question that you might already be thinking. Why are we studying biology in the context of a series of videos about psychology? Well, remember the definition of psychology. Psychology is the scientific study of the mind, the brain, and behavior. So obviously the brain is part of that, but even the mind and behavior. Both thoughts and behavior originate from what goes on in the brain. So we need to understand what goes on in the brain before we can really understand thoughts and behavior. That is, we need to understand the micro before we can understand the macro. Let's dive into it. The smallest components that we care about in the brain as psychologists are neurons. Neurons are nerve cells specialized for communication in the brain. They're basically responsible for thought, and without them, we couldn't really think, and we probably wouldn't even be alive. We have lots of different neurons in our brains. It's estimated that every human brain contains approximately 85 million neurons. Just for some context, if we were to take all the neurons lined up in a single person's brain, we would have enough neurons to line up between New York and California and make the trip back and forth five different times. So we have a lot of different neurons, and that's just a testament to how important they are. So let's take some time to sort of uncover the anatomy of a neuron, starting with the cell body. The cell body is also known as the soma, which literally just translates to body. And the soma, or cell body, is the central part of the neuron. And it's essentially responsible for the life of the neuron, keeping the neuron alive. It contains the neuron's nucleus, which has a lot of important stuff that we're not going to talk about here, and it's responsible for creating and renewing cell components over time. Next, we have the dendrites. There are lots of them. I'm zoning in on one sort of dendrite over here. The dendrites receive signals from other neurons. Next, we have the axon, the long part of the neuron that extends from the cell body to our next part here, the axon terminal, sometimes called the terminal buttons. And this is what sends the signals to other neurons. Finally, we have this part here called the myelin sheath, which covers that axon, that long part of the neuron, which the signal sends down. The myelin sheath is an insulated wrapper made up of glial cells that covers the axon. And the point of the myelin sheath is to speed up neuronal transmission. Without the myelin sheath, neuronal transmission would be very slow, we would think very slowly, there would be lots of other problems, and in fact there are some neurodegenerative diseases that are characterized by a loss of myelin sheath, and it can be very debilitating. Now I want to foreshadow what we're going to talk about in the next video. The focus of this video, as you'll see, is essentially what happens within a neuron, but a lot of really important stuff, in fact more important stuff for our purposes, happens between neurons. And the space between neurons is called the synapse. This is essentially just empty space, but it's important because this is where neuronal transmission, called neurotransmission, takes place. This is communication between neurons, and I just want to say one little bit about how that works, and again, that'll be the focus of the next video. So, how does this work? I've been talking a lot about signals in the brain, right? The dendrites and the axons send and receive signals, all of that good stuff, but what are those signals? Well, those signals are neurotransmitters, which again will be the focus of the next video. But synaptic vesicles, as you see here in this little depiction I have of a synaptic vesicle cell, is essentially like a taxi cab, an Uber or a Lyft, just to modernize it a little bit. But synaptic vesicles carry neurotransmitters. And these synaptic vesicles travel down the length of the axon and they burst at the axon terminal or the terminal buttons, releasing those neurotransmitters in the synapse, which generates an electrical response in the next neuron. And this is the sort of bird's eye view overall picture of how neurotransmission works. But I've talked about signals. There's another sort of term I'm using here that I haven't really explained, electrical responses. So let's take a closer look at what happens in the axon to understand what I mean by an electrical response. This electrical response or impulse is called an action potential. And these are the last important thing we need to understand before moving on to the next set of content in our next set of videos. Action potentials are electrical impulses that travel down the axon, triggering the release of neurotransmitters at the axon terminal. So how do action potentials work? 
action potentials are dependent on an uneven distribution of ions, positively and negatively charged ions, across the membrane surrounding the neuron, specifically the axon of the neuron. So you're looking at three different types of ions here. Chlorine, Cl-, sodium, Na+, and potassium, K+. And how it works, what generates this electrical impulse in the neuron, is that since there's an uneven distribution of ions on either side of the membrane, the borders of the neuron, the positive, in particular, uh, ions here want to rush inside of the neuron, and that's what generates a spike in charge. That's what generates what I've been calling an electrical impulse. And then they rush back out. So the process looks something like this. All right, that took way too long to do, so I'm going to do it a couple more times just to get my money's worth. All right, looks just like that. There we go. So a couple of quick final notes about action potentials before we move on. Action potentials follow the all or none law. This essentially means that there's no such thing as like a weak signal, a weak action potential. There either is an action potential or there isn't. The signal is sent or it fails to send, and that's it. As a final note, last bit of information here, there's a refractory period or a resting period after every single action potential. Now, action potentials fire very quickly. Neurons fire quickly, like the crackling of a fire, very fast. But there is technically a resting period called this refractory period that happens after each firing, uh, a period in which the cell cannot fire again. So again, in our next video, we're going to focus on what happens between neurons instead of just focusing, as we did on this video, on what happens within neurons. So stay tuned for that.